Father, thank you for a new day, life, even life in Christ, that we get to be together, to know life under your authority, under the authority and lordship of your son, and under the sanctifying, guiding influence of your spirit. God, when we open your word, our prayer is that you would enlighten our eyes, that the unfolding of your words would give light, even in dealing with a dark topic like sin. God, give us, give us eyes to see, uh, help us to see clearly on this subject so that we might better honor you in the world, so that we might more accurately uphold your name and uphold your truth. God, if you would grant us these things, we would be uh, forever thankful that we get to participate with you in accomplishing the end for the reason that we exist, to bring you glory, to rightly represent you. And so we pray that you would accomplish these things in us as a result of us humbly submitting to what you have to say. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Listen to John Piper describe what is the essence of sin. What is sin? The glory of God not honored. The holiness of God not reverenced. The greatness of God not admired. The power of God not praised. The truth of God not sought. The wisdom of God not esteemed. The beauty of God not treasured. The goodness of God not savored. The faithfulness of God not trusted. The commandments of God not obeyed. The justice of God not respected. The wrath of God not feared. The grace of God not cherished. The presence of God not prized. The person of God not loved. That is sin. That captures well the very point we've been making over the past few weeks, that sin is against God. Sin is sinful because sin is against God. Sin misrepresents God. It, in practice, says something false about God. The sinfulness of sin is captured in that reality that it is contrary to the very nature and character or attributes of God himself. We've been discussing over the past couple weeks what we've been calling practical atheism. Practical atheism. Not all men are bold enough or rather foolish enough to verbalize their atheism, to articulate arguments in favor of God's non-existence, but even those who are not so foolish still live like practical atheists. Even the believer, when he sins, practices disbelieving something that is true about God. Now, our ability to diagnose our own sin, to see the ways that our sin is against God, depends much on our knowledge of God's attributes. In other words, if we do not know God deeply, then we will only see sin bleakly. Clarity about the nature of sin requires knowledge of the character of God. If sin is primarily against him, and the relationship, it is his relationship to sin, the distance between the two, and that sin is an infinite offense against him, then our ability to see sin clearly, to see the heinousness of any particular sin, directly correlates to what we think about God as it relates to that sin. If we do not know God deeply, then we will only know sin bleakly. Uh, this morning, I want to apply what we've been studying about practical, athe 
practical atheism to a few particular sins. The scriptures show us how to view our sin. The scriptures tell us how to see it's contrary to God nature. Uh, It does this by embedding theology into passages that address specific sins. I'm sure you've noticed that as you've read your Bible, in passages that talk about specific sins, you can see the way those sins relate to the theology that's discussed in those very same passages. Uh, We've looked at a couple examples, uh, primarily Matthew 21 last week, as well as some other passages, but then before that, Genesis 3. And so we saw Old and New Testament in the fall and in the crucifixion of Christ, how sin aims at the very person of God, even in such a way that if God removed all restraints, every sin would aim at the removal of God from existence. It would aim to murder God himself. That was no more vividly illustrated than in the crucifixion. When God finally made himself killable, prone to death, the author of life made himself able to die, then man did just that and took God's life in a sense. Even though he laid his life down, man aimed at the life of God. So as we look at and just walk through this exercise together this morning and see the practical atheism in common sins, this is going to be an exercise that hopefully you can take and carry into your own heart shepherding uh, as you seek to study your own heart, study your own sin, then you'll be able to carry these same principles forward even if the particular besetting sin, maybe in your own life, isn't one that we address this morning. Uh, I've got at least five that we can get to. We'll see how far we can get in this. But this is going to be useful for your own heart shepherding as well as for counseling others in the body, uh, as well as for evangelism. And so the first sin that I want to look at to start is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. We'll look at this uh, first in unbelievers. Before we look at believers, let's just see this contrary to God, self-righteousness in unbelievers. How is self-righteousness against God? Well, first and foremost, self-righteousness, when an unbeliever seeks to establish their own righteousness before God, seeks to save themselves by their own good works, this is first and foremost against God's honor or against his glory. God gets great glory for all of eternity even by rescuing men on his own through faith. When God gives a new heart, fully furnished with faith that believes in God and in how he says men and women and children must come and be reconciled to him, God receives great glory. Ephesians 1, three times, to the praise of, to the praise of, to the praise of the glory of his grace. And so God receives worship. When an unbeliever seeks to reconcile themselves to God from some other way through their own good works, what they would call good, through their own righteousness. This is self-righteousness. This takes aim at God's honor. William Plummer says this, to try to go to heaven in any other way than by Christ shows that we wish to rob him of the honor of saving us. This is what we were doing practically when we resisted God's ordained means of salvation and tried to get in some other way. So self-righteousness is against God's honor. Go to Romans chapter 10. It's not only against God's honor. It 
in Romans chapter 10. Paul's message as he unpacks the gospel is still intersecting plenty with this primary message that righteousness comes through faith and not through the law. And so in verse 3, he indicts the Jews for their unbelief. He says, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You see in that initial statement in verse 3, the righteousness of God is opposite to seeking to establish your own. To seek to establish your own righteousness is to reject the righteousness that God himself provides. And so self-righteousness is against God's righteousness. Self-righteousness, in essence, says to God, I got this. I'm righteous enough. In fact, the righteousness that you provide, I'm so abundant in my own righteousness that I can provide sufficient righteousness for myself. If At the very least, if it doesn't call God unrighteous, it at least says I'm as righteous as God. And at worst, casts off God's righteousness as something detestable, something that's actually not holy, not good, not righteous, and says I've got something better. Uh, Self-righteousness is against God's honor and against God's righteousness. It's also against God's law. We saw it there in verse 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And before that, in Romans 3, this rejects again God's purpose for the law. Romans 3 verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Where there are rules, you will find man opposing those rules, even the rules that he himself establishes, whether that's uh, law given through Moses from God coming down from Sinai, here it is, obey this, or whether it's man-made laws, law proves or highlights man's own sinfulness. We can't even keep to our own moral standards, much less can we keep to God's. And so Paul makes this point, that is not how anyone, no flesh, will be justified in his sight. It's to prove the knowledge of sin, not to justify oneself. So even self-righteous unbelievers would have to reject the purpose of God's law while they seek to establish their own. They spurn, if you will, the intended end of God in giving law. It says to God, you have one purpose in the law. I have a better one. You intend me to know sin through the law. I intend to know righteousness through the law and to establish my own. In that, you can see how a man's uh, trusting himself. So even in that heart disposition toward the law, what else is man rejecting? He's rejecting God's wisdom. The law came from God's wise mind. And where man rejects the purpose, the wise purpose of God in the law, and says he's got a better idea for the law, he's accusing God of folly. And so he's again rejecting another attribute of God, finding fault in God in another way, in his very wisdom where he turns to himself and trusts himself to have a better purpose than God in the law. 
even jumping backwards again to Romans 1, we see that this gospel of which Paul is not ashamed, verse 16 in Romans 1, this gospel is the power of God for salvation. It takes power to save sinful men. That requires the power of God himself. So if salvation requires power to accomplish, and man through his own righteousness seeks to accomplish his own salvation, then he is also implying that he is able Capable, able, powerful, those are all power-related words, right? I'm able to do, do this on my own. I know you're able, maybe, but I'm able too. The omnipotence that God possesses, the, the strength that God must exercise to save sinful men from the domination and power of sin... The sinner who is self-righteous says, yeah, I can do that too. I'm strong. Watch this. And so it's against God's honor, righteousness, law, power, and even knowledge. Just this logically follows. If you're going to declare yourself innocent of sins, then you have to know which sins to declare yourself innocent of. And so God's omniscience is necessary to save us. He must possess unfathomable understanding, uh, understanding and knowledge without boundaries that knows all things without effort instantaneously. He has to remember all past sins that you've committed, Christian, as well as all future sins that you might commit, that you will commit, and he had to know them all when he punished Jesus for every one of them. At the thought, motivation, desire, deed, word level, he had to know all of those things at the same time to exhaust his wrath against each particular sin so that once that wrath was exhausted, he could then say, that sinner is no longer responsible, no longer will endure the wrath of God for those particular sins. That is God's omniscience or all knowledge, his knowledge at work in salvation. The sinner who says, I am going to save myself by my own works, by my own ability to declare myself righteous, implies, he may not think of it this way intentionally, but he is at least rejecting God's knowledge in favor of his own, as if he knows his own sinfulness better than God does. Self-righteousness is wicked. And by the time the self-righteous individual, all of their thoughts about God occur, just in one act of self-righteousness, if what he imagined God to be in that moment was true of God, then there would be no God because there would no longer be a holy, righteous lawgiver able to save with infinite knowledge and unfathomable wisdom. So self-righteousness in that sense treats God like he doesn't exist or prefers that God does not exist in favor of establishing his own righteousness. And just to pause for a second to consider We were all there at some point, and God, while we were in that condition, chose to do what? Save. Forgive people who, if they had their way, would remove him from existence, preferred him not to exist, thought of themselves as higher than God, and would gladly seat their own selves on his throne. And God forgave. Incredible. It would be impossible to believe that if it weren't true. Think of yourself not as you were, Christian, as an unbeliever, but now even as a believer. 
when you seek in those unfortunate moments, those sinful times, to establish your own righteousness, not in regards to salvation any longer, that delusion that you could be righteous before God on your own has been done away with in salvation, praise the Lord. But practically, how do we, how do we actually do this still in some way? Well, what about in attempting sanctification by human means? Is that not an act of self-righteousness? Hey, God, thanks for salvation. Now I got this. I can, I can sanctify myself and practically make myself righteous on my own terms by some human wisdom, some man-made mechanation, your own good ideas. God says this is the path to sanctification, to believe him, saturate my heart in the truth, to hide his word in my heart that I wouldn't sin against him, but that takes a lot of work. I would rather just change my environment and call that righteousness, call that sanctification. God says I'm supposed to be motivated by his glory, things that he tells me in his word are worthy of my motivations, I would rather just be motivated by some carnal desire, some temporary comfort, and then say, see, I'm being different, I'm being sanctified. That in itself is an act of self-righteousness. When we seek to pursue sanctification on our own terms and not by God's means, not being motivated in the ways that he says we should be. Paul chastised the Galatians for this very thing. Uh, Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? We also do this by refusing to confess sin, and these are both against God's grace. These are, in the believer, times when we reject God's grace at work in us, God's grace that would sanctify us, in attempting to sanctify ourselves by human means or by refusing to confess sin. Go to 1 John chapter 1. John helpfully tells us in 1 John 1 verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, great. No Christian says that. No Christian says, I don't have sin. I'm not a sinner. We know better. But look what's contrary or what's contrasted with saying we have no sin. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's interesting. If we say we have no sin, this is true. If we confess our sins, this is true of us. So to not confess sin is the same practically as saying you have none. What's the difference between someone who says, I I don't sin, and someone who never admits they sin? Not much. So by not confessing sin in moments when it's called for or not confessing sin to God, not confessing sin in the ways that God says so so that you flatter yourself that it's not as bad as you might think, as, you know, the person might think that you're confessing sin to. So you use lesser terms than what the scriptures actually use. You call it. You know, frustration instead of I was angry. I was just annoyed. Is that why you were yelling? Really? We must confess sin the way that God prescribes. In doing so, we acknowledge we need the very grace of God. The grace of God required to forgive us, verse 9, as well as to cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness to sanctify us. In believers, lingering, indwelling self-righteousness is also against God's wisdom when we call man-made standards righteousness. Man-made standards, calling those things righteous, is in essence to find fault with God's law. You know, maybe some level of restraint. Maybe there are liberties that other Christians choose to take that you don't like them taking. And so you impose a standard of righteousness on them that God doesn't. And so in that moment, what are you doing? Hey, in God's infinite wisdom, he didn't give them a thou shall not in this area. But I know better, so I'm going to. That is self-righteousness. Taking your own standards and making them the standard of righteousness rather than saying to God, your wisdom is sufficient. Let me help my brother or sister in Christ just make a wise decision and trust God with their conscience. And then obviously, this is against God's righteousness. Anytime we substitute what God calls righteousness for something else, it's against God's righteousness. You can see in self-righteousness, pre- and post-conversion, the nature of self-righteousness, wherever it may be found, is practical atheism. To grow in our hatred of self-righteousness, we must grasp these thoughts. You have to grasp this reality. Search out your sin till you know that's what I'm not believing about God, or that's what I'm saying in my heart when I commit this sin and grow in your hatred in that way. Next, not only self-righteousness, but diagnosing the atheism of being unteachable. Being unteachable. Teachability, if you want a definition of teachability, Teachability is simply humility receiving instruction. Humility receiving instruction. It is the one who is lowly enough to say, I need to be taught. I need to be counseled. I don't know everything. And so I need help from outside of myself. And my job is to receive wisdom. I am not the source of wisdom. The wisdom that I have is, in fact, a shallow pool of wisdom. And so all throughout the scriptures, God instructs his people to receive wisdom. This is the first command in Proverbs is to listen. Proverbs 1.8. In a book all about wisdom, the first command is hear or listen. That's the the term that would have implied receiving instruction with the intention of obeying knowledge, of obeying that instruction. And so the person who is unteachable practically puts themselves in the position of God. God is the only one who cannot be taught. Go to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. I think that a lack of teachability is probably the hardest counseling issue of them all because if someone is teachable, any other counseling issue, any other sin struggle that someone has, if they are just willing to humble themselves and receive God's wisdom, then then they have answers. They can get answers. They're humble and can grow, can be sanctified away from that sin. But what do you do when the issue itself is an unwillingness and arrogance that rejects instruction? The only way to grow is by being instructed. Thankfully, God can humble even unteachable sinners but it's an uphill battle. 
God says of himself in Isaiah 40, verse 13, who has directed the spirit of Yahweh or as his counselor has informed him? The obvious rhetorical answer, which you should practice answering, is no one. No one has directed the spirit of Yahweh. No one has been his counselor and informed him. Verse 14, with whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? Again, he consulted no one. No one gave him imparted to him understanding. And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding. No one did any of those things. God is truly uneducated. He has never grown. He has never, in in his knowledge, he has never learned new information. In fact, he knows already and always has known everything that actually has ever and ever will occur. All past history that has happened, God knew it beforehand. All future history, not just on earth, but all the way into eternity, which has no end, God was already, before he created anything, aware of the things that will happen 18 billion years into eternity. No one has ever taught him anything. And all of the possibilities, God knows. God knew before he created the world what would happen if Jeff Kershaw and Mandy sat a row up. Who would be sitting in their chairs? And where would the couple in front of them be sitting instead? If you had arrived two minutes earlier, who would you have talked to this morning? What conversations would you have had than the ones that you didn't or did? God knows those things. Would you be praying for other things had you come sooner because you talk to somebody who mentioned something that they needed prayer for? God knows. God's knowledge is at that level. The person who resists instruction, though they may never say, I am the wisest being in the universe, just by virtue of being unwilling to receive instruction, they practically believe that. I, I often ask unbelievers in evangelism, um, you know, when I'm trying to find out what is their source of authority, I'll ask them something like, who do you trust to tell you what to believe, what to think, what to feel, what to do, how to live? Who do you trust like that? And inevitably, the answer is, well, no one. I'm not going to hand over my logic, my reasoning capabilities to someone outside of myself. And so I try and help them to understand that what you believe, you may not be so arrogant in this moment to admit this. I don't know if that makes you arrogant or more deceitful, you know. But the the point is you believe you are the wisest being in the universe. You don't trust anyone outside of yourself or more than yourself. And so practically you have claimed deity. I am the only one who's trustworthy with my reason. I don't know of anyone else who is like me, they could say. And so being unteachable is against God's knowledge, against God's wisdom. It says, I am all-knowing, I am all-wise. And because it is against God's knowledge, then when God, in a passage like Isaiah 44, 7, stakes his own divine nature on his infinite knowledge, the person who claims to surpass God in knowledge, 
then also believes that they surpass him in divinity. God says, who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. When God asks, who is like me? He seamlessly goes into an ability to declare the future, uh, his omniscience. He ties his deity, his divine nature, and his omniscience together. So to reject one is to reject the other. That's why people who don't honor God as God don't listen to God either. To reject his deity is to reject his knowledge. To reject his knowledge is to reject his deity. The person who claims they don't need to be taught then thinks of themselves in the same way God thinks of himself. One who does not need to be taught because he is God. Which also means uh, it's against God's trustworthiness. Just jump over to uh, Zephaniah, maybe a, certainly a less popular passage for us than Proverbs 3.5. Proverbs 3.5 says, Trust in the Lord. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. To lean on your own understanding is opposite trust in God. You find him not trustworthy if you insist on trusting yourself with your own reasoning, your own mind. Zephaniah 3.2 says the same thing, ties the same two things together. In reference to Jerusalem, she heeded no voice, she accepted no instruction, she did not trust in Yahweh, she did not draw near to her God. So in that verse, the indictment against Judah she won't listen. She heeded no voice. She accepted no instruction. That's her unteachability. And tied closely with that is her not trusting God. Uh, parents, you can help your children understand this. When they are refusing instruction, when they are resisting instruction, it's because they are not trusting the Lord. When God has told children the very best thing for them to do is honor their mother and father, obey their parents, They don't trust him with those instructions, and they insist on doing something else. They don't even draw near to him as one worthy of being close to. Uh, it's a denial of God's goodness. Psalm 119.68 says, You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. A willingness to be taught acknowledges the goodness, the inherent goodness of God. This is also uh, against God's greatness, according to Zephaniah 3.7. Again, surely you will revere me. Surely you will revere me. The one who counts God worthy of reverence because he is a great king above all gods, if you will, does what? Accept instruction. Surely you will revere me. Accept instruction. Accepting God's instruction is an act of reverence. Thirdly, a fear of man. A fear of man is atheism at the heart. To fear man is to disbelieve God, count him worthy of not existing. Uh, this is against God's greatness, just Flip over to Proverbs 29, 25. Helpful passage that captures the exchange happening whenever man is feared. There are two, uh, what I like to call worship words in this, in this verse. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in Yahweh is safe. Fear and trust, whatever you regard as ultimately worthy of fear and worthy of trust is what you worship. What's worthy of all my fear 
what's worthy of all my trust is God to me. So the person whom I fear most is my God. That's the person I worship functionally. And so here, those two things are set in contrast. Uh, contrast the fear of man is opposite whoever trusts in Yahweh. You cannot do both those things simultaneously. Fear man and trust God. And then you just see the effects. One lays a snare, the other provides safety. So God is not great. He is not worthy of my trust or my worship. Uh, He's also not worthy of my trust. So the fear of man is against God's trustworthiness. It says, in a moment, when I choose the fear of man over the fear of God, it says practically at the heart level to God, God, I'm more in awe than, of this man than you. This person is more fearful to me, more fearsome than you. They are worthy of directing and guiding my actions and thoughts in this moment more than you are. God has specifically commanded this practice, this action to be put off all throughout the scriptures. When God commands, do not be afraid. He says that about uh, circumstances. He says that about people. Do not be afraid. To not do that, to fail to do that, is a rejection of God's authority in that moment. I know you're you're telling me to do this. I'm going to go do something else. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to actually give in to this temptation to be afraid. And so this is a rejection of God's authority and acceptance of some other standard, some other inclination in man. You can write down... Oh, you've got the verse references there. Great. Listen at what John Flavel says about this, uh, what's happening in the fear of man and how it is against God's authority. He says, urge upon your heart, counseling Christians, urge upon your heart the express prohibitions of Christ in this case and let your heart stand in awe of the violation of them. He hath charged you not to fear. Does the voice of a man make thee to tremble and shall not the voice of God? If thou art of such a timorous spirit, how is it that thou fearest not to disobey the commands of Jesus Christ? Methinks the command of Christ should have as much power to calm as the voice of a poor worm to terrify thy heart. So he thinks that the command of Christ, just one more time, the command of Christ should have as much power to calm, remove fear, as the voice of a poor worm, a man, to terrify thy heart. We cannot fear creatures sinfully till we have forgotten God. Did we remember what he is and what he has said We should not be of such feeble spirits. Bring thyself then to this reflection in times of danger. If I let into my heart the slavish fear of man, I must let out the reverential awe and fear of God. And dare I cast off the fear of the Almighty for the frowns of a man? Shall I lift up proud dust above the great God? Shall I run upon certain sin to shun a probable danger? Oh, keep thy heart by this consideration. That's excellent counsel. And until we have put those two things in opposition to each other to realize I am casting off the fear of God when I practically fear man, then it's no wonder that we don't more readily turn away from the fear of man.
Christ said in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear him who can kill the body and not kill the soul, but fear him who has the power or who is able to cast both body and soul into hell. So even to fear man in that moment, one practically is not fearing God, specifically fearing his power, marveling at the power of God. Just, I mean, how many times, you you can recognize this in your own experience, how many times when you feared man were you also thinking, he can't, he has no hell to put me in, but God does. God is the one with all authority, not this person. We've never had that thought in mind and then still sinned. We've never been convinced of that and still found ourselves fearing man. To wholly embrace that truth would make us unflinching in the face of whatever fear was in front of us. And so what do we have to do? Practice Romans 12 too. Renew the mind so that you're not conformed to the world, but transformed instead. That is mind renewal. To have the truth so hidden in your heart about who God is that in a moment of temptation, you're already more convinced of the truth than you are of whatever lie your heart is tempted to believe. That's heart shepherding. And that takes work. Next, what about uh, not atheism, anxiety, number four. Anxiety, anxiety is against God's sufficiency. This is a favorite passage of mine and Emily's over the years. This has counseled us many a times. Psalm 94, 19 When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. When the cares of my heart are many, when all kinds of concerns abound, and even this morning I'm sure you can name several concerns of your own, family you're concerned about, work situations, that consume your mind space, health issues, all of those things. And yet, the psalmist here says, in the face of all of those concerns, all of those cares, your consolations cheer my soul. And in this context, I think the consolations are actually what God says about his own character. That's what's in view in Psalm 94. This is how the psalmist uh, comforts himself as he remembers truth about God's attributes, truth about God's own nature. And so what the psalmist is implying here is that God himself, even in the meditation on God's character, is sufficient to remove my anxiety. So it ascribes greatness and glory to God's sufficiency. God, your character is sufficient for me to not be anxious. Anxiety is against God's sufficiency. It says to God, when we are anxious, God, you're great and all, but not enough. You're not great enough. That's a, an attack on God's sufficiency. Go to 1 Peter 5. Another helpful passage on anxiety. If you're looking for a really good book on anxiety, by the way, Richard Caldwell's Answering Anxiety. Super thin booklet. He walks through 1 Peter 5. We've got that at the book table if you're looking for a resource on the subject. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 5, you younger men likewise be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. This is a ongoing supply of grace 
to those who are just willing to humble themselves, to practice humility. And since this is true, he says, verse 6, since God is opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble, therefore humble yourselves then under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. How do I do that, Peter? Well, verse 7 tells us, casting all your anxieties on him is how you humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And why would I do that? Well, because he cares for you. So when I am failing to practice verse 7, to cast all my anxieties on God, then what's practically happening in the heart? What's the practical atheism going on there? Well, this is not believing God's grace, because if I believed that God's grace was to the humble, then I would humble myself. God's grace in that moment is not a motivator for me when I'm being anxious. Neither is God's power, according to verse 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. If God is not in my thoughts, if God's power just doesn't cross my mind, then of course I'm not going to humble myself under his mighty hand. I'm not thinking that his hand is mighty. And so I'm not casting my anxieties on him. I'm not believing God's sufficiency. I'm not believing God's grace. I'm not believing God's power. And I'm not believing his goodness that he cares for me. You could add sovereignty to that because he's the one who cares for you. That requires him to be in control. So disbelieving these attributes of God in a moment allows for anxiety. God's not good. He doesn't care. Or he's not in control. Or he can't be trusted with these cares that I have. These things that are tempting me to be anxious. Or maybe he doesn't know I have these cares. And he can't be trusted to carry them for me. I can't cast them on them on, on him because he can't handle it, perhaps. You can just see in a passage in 5, 6, and 7, three verses, how a particular sin is in view. And just in the, the way that the biblical writers, as God speaks through them, they counsel us to think of sin and how it intersects with our view of God. So that if we have a high view of God, that impacts what we do with sin. It's all here in the passage. So if you're struggling with a particular sin, find a passage dealing with that sin and extract the theology from it. How does the theology tell me to think about the sin? Matthew 6 is obviously another good passage on this subject of anxiety. And Jesus' point there actually begins not in uh, what's probably under the heading in your Bible dealing with anxiety, but in verse 24 of Matthew 6, just before it. The reason Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, launches into a discussion about anxiety not worrying about your life or what you, you'll eat or about your body, what you'll put on. The reason he launches into a discussion about that particular issue is because, verse 24, he just finished making the point that no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot... Take this to heart. You cannot serve God and possessions or wealth. And because you can't serve two masters, God and wealth, 
Verse 25, for that reason, I say to you, do not be worried. Don't be anxious. Just fix in your mind, whenever I'm anxious, I am worshiping. Something else has my allegiance. Something else has captivated my heart as infinitely worthy of my worship. And then you can trace back, okay, I'm fearful of this thing happening. Why? Well, because then if that happened, my life would look like this. And why is that so bad? Well, because if my life looked like this, then I would have to do this. And why why is that so bad? Because if that were true, then this. And you just trace that all the way back to the ultimate reason, and you'll find out what you're worshiping. That is your functional God, and in that moment, you become, that moment of anxiety, you become a practical atheist. Doesn't change God's grace to us in salvation. It doesn't make you an unbeliever, thankfully, in that moment, because we would be unsaved constantly. But this only highlights the greatness of God's mercy the greatness of God's compassion to us as believers. Wow, I still commit that kind of sin? And God is continually pardoning, practically helping to sanctify us, even causing us to humble ourselves and embrace this view of sin, what's happening in our heart. Even accepting that this is going on is really good evidence of salvation. That you're willing to indict yourself in this way still as a believer proves the point. Wow, God must have done a work in you. And so what is this? This is encouragement to fight sin more ardently, to fight sin more wisely to put off sin more quickly by actually tracing it back to this contrary to God nature so that we can see it in all of its sinfulness. We can own it with as much responsibility as we can claim, as we ought to claim. And God, what we already read in 1 John 1, Jesus is faithful and righteous to forgive, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the goal, sanctification. God, thank you so much for your word to make these things clear to us, what we could never see clearly on our own, what we would be unwilling to acknowledge apart from your spirit at work in us. And I pray again for this church that we would be a people who freely acknowledges uh, our sinfulness, not because we glory in being broken people or in just being sinners still, but because we are actually broken by our remaining indwelling sin. And yet we are full of hope, knowing that one day you will sanctify us completely in body, soul, and spirit, The God of peace, who is faithful, will accomplish this on our behalf. And we long for that day. We are excited and eager to finally put off sin so that you might get all of the glory that you deserve from the life that you have imparted in us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.